Let us begin our worship this evening with prayer. O Lord God, as we enter your presence for worship, please send your Holy Spirit to guide, direct, and fill us with a sense of humble awe as we consider all that you have done for us through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Grant that his resurrection from the dead might serve to strengthen us in life and comfort us when we face death. Accept our prayers and praises as they flow from faith this day. In your name we pray. Amen. Let us open up our worship this evening by singing hymn 215, printed in your bulletin, Draw Us to Thee. Conduct this service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights above. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His heavenly hosts. How majestic is the Lord's name in all the earth. He has set His glory above the heavens. For the Lord is the most high over all the earth. God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. The Lord reigns, but the nations tremble. He sits on the throne between the cherubim and the earth's The throne of our God will last forever and ever. Praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. We now take this opportunity to confess our sins, knowing that through Christ those sins are forgiven. For I know my transgression, 
and my sin is always before me. Let us call upon Jesus Christ to forgive our sins. But our iniquities have separated us from you, O Lord, and you, our sins have hidden your face from you, so that you will not hear. And the Apostle Paul tells us this. With such a frightening reality in front of us, knowing that our sins have taken us away from you, Lord, and that they have brought us death, we plead to your throne of mercy. O oh Lord, listen when we say... The Lord hears and he forgives. As far as the east is from the west, so I will put away your sins, says the Lord. In the blood of Jesus Christ, you are washed clean of your offenses before the Lord God Almighty. Listen then and take comfort when Jesus says, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. Let us continue singing the hymn printed there on page 3. ascend and triumph far above the heavens. We implore of you not to leave us comfortless, but to send your spirit of truth promised by the Father. We ask this knowing that you will grant the promises you make. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our first scripture lesson this evening, we are considering the ascension. This is the Sunday after ascension. Ascension was Thursday. Thursday marks the 40 days after Christ's resurrection. Our first lesson takes a look at Exodus chapter 14 verses 21 through 31. The 10 plagues weren't striking enough. The Lord delivered the children of Israel once again from Pharaoh in a most remarkable way. In parting the Red Sea waters and providing a dry path for the children of Israel and having the waters recede on the Egyptians, the Lord made it clear. He is the deliverer, and so the Lord is the one that delivers us from our sins. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them in the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning, watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of a cloud 
looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled into, into it. The Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. Of all the hosts of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Here ends our first scripture reading. Our second scripture reading is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. Christ returns, and it will not be a battle, but more of a crowning of a conquering king. This king will return as a judge to those who have rejected him. They will get their wish, an eternity outside of God. But to those that love him and cling to him, they will receive the eternity of life everlasting with him. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like the flame of fire, and his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the army is heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following, on, following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will treat the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Here ends our scripture lesson. At this point, we can make a confession of our faith found in the words of the Apostles' Creed, which you can find printed on page 5 in your service bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Let us continue by singing hymn 212, all the verses printed on page 5 and 6 in your service bulletin.
You ascend on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up. God is our salvation. Our God is a God of salvation. And to God, the Lord, belong deliverance from death. His words taken from Psalm 68, verses 18 through 19. Dear fellow redeemed, I have absolutely no doubt that you in your lifetime, by the grace of God, have heard many sermons preached about the birth of Jesus Christ. Christmas Eve, Christmas Day provide wonderful vehicles for that very discussion. They, they take our attention to this most amazing event in history where you have the communication of attributes that the eternal infinite son of God becomes a human being. Jesus leaves his throne in heaven. He abandons his place as rightful ruler of all things and submits himself under the very law that he himself wrote. Jesus does this to be our substitute so that he can be like us in every way. And so conceived in the Virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit as Jesus Christ, Jesus is born. Now, why would God do something like that? Well, no doubt, you've heard many sermons about that. In fact, no doubt, Good Friday sermons center on that very event. Good Friday serves as a beautiful vehicle to speak of that monumentous moment when the Son of God, who became man, all God, all man, all the time, laid down his life, for us. The Son of God did something we can't do. He lived the perfect life and then, as the perfect substitute for man, gives himself over to divine justice, the justice our sins deserve, Jesus takes upon himself in our place. The perfect God cannot withstand sinfulness. His holiness won't allow it. Yet in love for us, Jesus has the face of the Father turned away from him. He is forsaken so that you and I will never have to be forsaken by God. God's face, his countenance, looks upon us favorably because Jesus did that. You hear that, Lord willing, every week, but especially on Good Friday. But now Good Friday wouldn't really mean too much to us if Jesus stayed dead. That's why a few days later on Sunday, You hear another message, and no doubt, by the grace of God, you've heard sermon upon sermon preached about this event that took place on that resurrection or Easter Sunday, three days after Jesus died. That is, God the Father accepts the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and the Father raises Jesus up from the dead and restores him back to life. Jesus then becomes the first fruits. For all that will die in him, that is, they will die with saving faith in Christ. We are connected to Christ. His death is our death. His resurrection is our resurrection. He is the first, and we will follow by faith in him. Now, those are the big three. They're even on the calendar. They're on every calendar. But when it comes to our salvation, there's another event that is just as important as the other three, but for reasons that I'm sure we can come up with real easily, this event goes largely unnoticed. Very unnoticed. Not because Christ didn't talk about it. Oh, Jesus talked about this. In fact, when you go to John, Jesus himself said, I must return to my Father. I am going back to my Father, Jesus says, in order to prepare a place for you, prepare a place for us, to prepare a place for all believers. He also says he's returning to the Father that the Holy Spirit may come to us in a magnificent way. He said he will return to the right hand of the Father and then the paraclete, the comforter, the helper, the Holy Spirit would come to his people. The event to which Jesus then would leave, this important step is what we call the ascension. 
the Ascension is a very straightforward event. I mean, it's pretty easy to talk about. Jesus basically does this. He ascends to the Father in heaven. Yet, just as important as his birth, his death, and his resurrection, so is the ascension of Jesus. This is a step of love for us, and we don't want to miss this. Even more, ascension isn't about heaven. To a degree, heaven plays in there. That's where Jesus returns, and that's where we'll be. Where Jesus says, we want to be, we all agree with that. But ascension in all, for us, in in all functioning reality, has less to do with heaven and has more to do with earth. Because you notice in the ascension of Jesus, he leaves his people with a charge. You, me, we have a purpose right here, right now. That's why we're here. And we're not here. We're here because the Lord has a reason for that, a purpose. But he also lets us know a few things in giving us this purpose. He's letting us know, one, heaven is real. You don't need a best-selling book to tell you that. You got the Bible. Heaven is real. You also have this. Heaven is your real home. Look around. This isn't your real home. It's a great place. It's fun to be here for the most part. It can be difficult. But you're just going through. You're a pilgrim. You're passing through. This isn't your home. Your ambition, my ambition, is to be where Jesus is and to inherit the promises that Jesus offers. And so Jesus ascends. He takes his visible form away from our eyes. And so for this very short time, and this is a short time, we won't see Jesus physically, but we know he will return, and we know his presence is around us. And then we have that purpose, the blessed opportunity to share the good news of Christ, the Savior of all people. So we can say, our hope is in heaven, our work is on earth. Jesus' ascension fills us with faith and power to rest our hope in heaven and to carry us through with our work here on earth. With that in mind, let's consider Luke 24. We're just going to look at three verses, verse 50, 51, and 52. The he's Jesus. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. These are in fact God's word. They are therefore true, right, in all that they say in every conceivable way. They are perfect from the first word to the last word given to us by God. How wonderful it is to have something perfect, complete, and powerful in a sin-ridden world that we live in. We pray that God would bless us as we study these words this evening. To that end, we pray. Sanctify us by your truth, O Lord. Your word is truth. Amen. It's interesting. An event so important as this, and rightly put on the same level as the birth, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, so is his ascension. Luke is it for who talks about this. Now, I know, you might try to argue me with me a little bit and say, well, pastor, come on now. In the last chapter of Matthew 28, you have the Great Commission going, therefore, make disciples of all nations. Yes, that is true. Those are the words that Jesus speaks at his ascension, but Matthew doesn't talk about the ascension. He leaves you with that. Mark doesn't talk about it. John doesn't talk about it. But Luke does. Luke talks about it in the Gospel of Luke right here, last verses of the Gospel. And then Luke continues the conversation. He continues the event in Luke chapter 1, which is verses 1 through 11. If we're reading through Luke, uh, the Gospel now, it's conceivable and reasonable to say that verses 44 through 49, which go right before verse 50, 49, followed by 50. 44 through 49 are talking about the evening of resurrection. And then Luke hits the old fast-forward button and moves right to verse 50. Forty days later, he's talking about the ascension. So let's address a question right here. Why did Jesus wait 40 days? Why 40 days? Why not go up to heaven right away? He's going to go anyway. Why not 40 years? Why not 150 days? That was, in fact, the number that the earth was underwater, 150. Wouldn't that make sense? Well, I mean, we we could come up with all kinds of reasons why we think Jesus waited 40 days. 
Let me offer, though, a couple to think about. They seem pretty biblically reasonable to me. During the 40 days that Christ's visible presence was seen here on earth, you recall what he was doing. In fact, we have recorded for us throughout the Gospels 12 instances of Jesus physically appearing to his disciples. And they range from Jesus speaking to just one person to Jesus speaking to as many as 500 people in one time. In fact, when Jesus during the 40 days appeared, he gave Thomas one of the most blessed opportunities. Thomas on Easter evening is saying, I don't believe the women and I don't believe you. I don't think he's risen from the dead. And a week later, as you know, Jesus stands in his presence and says, Thomas, Here I am. Put your fingers in my hole on the side of my hands. Believe. And then, that's not enough, and that's amazing. That's not enough. You have Jesus delivering breakfast to the disciples in John 21. But even more than that, you have Jesus moves a little further with just Peter. Peter who denied him. Peter who disowned him. Peter who looks broken. And Jesus restores Peter back. Jesus says, and he gives him three times to confess his love to him. And Peter does. And then Jesus gives Peter this incredible charge, feed my sheep. Oh yes. I think we can say with confidence, Jesus remained for 40 days to prepare his disciples for when he would physically leave them and for the work that he's giving them. Also recall what he said in John 16, 7. Jesus said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus' departure means that he is going to remove his physical presence and he's going to send the Holy Spirit to his followers in a supernatural, wonderful way. And so we did. Let's address another question since we're addressing questions. Why did Jesus have to go anyway? There's somebody at some time and at some point, and maybe you've thought this yourself or even asked it, who says, wouldn't it be better if Jesus was physically here right now? Wouldn't you feel better if you were in the hospital and Jesus could physically walk in there and talk to you? If you knew you could pick up the phone and call Jesus and boom, there's Jesus. So why remove his physical presence? Why not remain here so we can see him face to face? Well, can I offer this for a thought process? If a person wants to question the ascension of Jesus, why stop there? I mean, if you're going to question God, go all the way, just Go all the way. I invite you to go all the way. Question God about the time of which Jesus was born. Wouldn't today be better? Just think if Jesus was around today, uh, physically, that is, during his time of humiliation, he could have a Snapchat and an Instagram and a Facebook. Would that be better for him communicating his message? Or Jesus could be on TV? And I mean, we're going to question God's actions. I mean, seriously? Create the world in six days? Why not have a videotape of it so we can watch it? If we're going to be in the business of questioning God, let's go all the way. But if we know this, that all that God does is perfect, right, and good, that what God does is complete in and of itself and always works for the best of all people according to his will, then if Jesus is going to remove himself, his physical presence, he's still here filling all things, but if he's going to remove his physical presence after 40 days, then that is the exact right best thing that could happen because that's what God chose to do. Martin Luther, when when talking about this whole fascinating conversation about the humiliation and the exaltation of Jesus, Martin Luther would say, we have historical facts all over the place. He's born. He dies. He comes back from the dead. He ascends to heaven. These are historical facts. But he would say, we're not just listening to history. We're listening to a gift. This is a gift. This is the gift of God giving himself to us. In doing this, as the psalmist prophesied there in Psalm 68, we read at the beginning, he, Jesus, takes captivity captive. You and I, 
were held captive by sin. We were under captivity. But our captors, sin, death, the devil, Jesus has taken them captive. And now we're free. Free and brought into the presence of God. No longer chained, no longer bound by this gift. The gift of God's Son, who's lived, died, rose, and ascended for us. So in Jesus' ascension, he gives power to his people. He gives power to you and me as his children. Now, power is an amazing conversation. It can go so many different ways. But about a year ago, I was watching a TV series on Netflix, Toys That Made Us. It's fun. It talks about toys from the 60s through, I don't know, the 90s, maybe beyond. And the whole idea is these toys influence certain generations of people from Star Wars to Star Trek to Barbie to G.I. Joe. And then they got to the one that really hit me as a kid, He-Man. And there I learned that the writers of He-Man were sitting around and they're working for Mattel and they wanted to come up with a toy that could get the little boys away from uh, Star Trek or Star Wars and get them interested in this. So they take this muscle-bound barbarian and they say, what do little boys want? And and some guy said, power. He's, He's right about that. He said, they want power. So let's invent a character that has the power. It's a little boy you dream about having the power to stay up late. To go outside. And if you have an older brother, you dream of having the power to beat him up. <laughs> and so He Man is born. He Man has the power. Well, that's fun and all, but real power comes from God. And Jesus is willing and ready to unloose this power among his people throughout the world. He gives this power. Jesus gave his life in death, and then took it back so that we could have this power to exercise in his name. And it truly is the greatest power. There's no greater power than this. None whatsoever. It's tempting to think that if we had physical power, for instance, I mean, who wouldn't listen to you if you could walk right over to Plano Medical Center and heal somebody near death? If you could just take the cancer away, you'd be more than a celebrity. You'd be sought after. People would say, you have power and compassion. But I ask you, what good is it to heal somebody that will only go on to die? What good will it be to raise somebody from the dead whom death will only come for them eventually anyway? I'm going to tell you that that's not real power. Real power is this. It carries the weight of eternal significance. In other words, it brings something that doesn't just last for 20, 30, 50, 80, 100, 1,000 years. It lasts forever, and you have that power. When you preach the gospel, you share the truth that God came into this world, that Jesus came in to rescue lost and dead sinners like us apart from God. He snatches us out of the hand of the devil and brings us into the family of the Father. Jesus takes us who are on a course of death. We're there already. And instead of spending eternity in utter darkness and abandonment from God, he brings us into the kingdom and family of God and gives us life. You can share that message. The ascension shows us and unleashes this power. Christ is risen. Christ is ascended. There's no stopping him now. And he chooses to use me and you, people like us, to share this truth and this power. The remaining moments, then I want to go back and examine verses 50 through 52. So look at verse 50. You see a beautiful verb right there. Led. Jesus led. Jesus takes them to Bethany. Bethany's familiar. For over three years, they've been going here. Jesus led them like a shepherd leading his flock to a familiar and safe place. Jesus leads them out because he's going to ascend back to where he was before he faced the cross. Then you notice another striking verb Lifting. He leads them and then he lifts up his hands. Now, if you grew up in a Jewish synagogue, every Jewish boy and girl at this time would know exactly what this meant. The priest would lift his hands to bless. A blessing is a greater giving to a lesser. God is the greatest and he gives to us and we need that blessing. And so Jesus gives his blessing. He gives his blessing to those that forsook him. He gives his blessing to those that ran away from him. 
You notice Jesus doesn't use this as an opportunity to scold them and say, okay, I'm removing my physical presence now. Are you guys going to abandon me again? Jesus doesn't say, I'm I'm just going to go pick a new and better team. You, You guys, you blew it. No, no, no. He calls them. He equips them. He blesses them. And then you get another word that's fascinating. After Jesus blesses them, the next verb you see is he parts from them. I think this is the ESV 2012. It's translated parted. That's a good word. Because Jesus doesn't depart from us as if he's gone. Jesus is here, but his physical presence does part from them, and it is apart from us. Yet Jesus is with them. He goes to heaven to fill all things. Now you might say, okay, well, where is heaven? I I can answer that right now. It's where Jesus is. You ask me, where is Jesus? He's in heaven. There you go. Seems today people don't want to believe the tough stuff. They want to run away from that. Let the Bible talk to you. The Bible speaks the truths of God. I mean, we wouldn't know. What would we know about God without the Bible? We know he must be powerful and great. Look at creation. We really wouldn't know anything. Throughout the Bible, God reveals himself to us. So the biblical truths of the ascension. Let me just rapid fire speed now. I'm going to go through a few. First, the ascension shows us, it signifies Jesus' completion of his work of redemption is fully accepted by God the Father. Take confidence, you are saved. Second, Jesus enters the presence of the Father on our behalf. Remember, he is the high priest that pleads for us at the side of the Father. We have an advocate, it is Christ. We need an advocate. Third, it displays God's mighty power. Paul says to the church in Ephesus, now that Jesus has ascended, he fills and rules all things. Fourth, the ascension marks his return back to the Father. When Christ became incarnate, when we have the communication of the attributes of the Son of God into man, you have something that's never happened before where the Son becomes man. Now, Is God and man, he returns back to the Father. Fifth, it's the inauguration of the giving of the Holy Spirit. True, you have to have the Holy Spirit in order to believe. You can't believe without him. Now you have this special outpouring that's about to happen in ten days. So Jesus, currently presiding king over all things, holds all things together, ruling in the interest of his people, and finally, finally, The ascension of Jesus shows us that he continues to sympathize with us in our struggles and in our weaknesses. He understands us, he knows us, and he saves us. The penman of Hebrews said, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. That's our advocate. That's our Savior, ruling on high for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds centered in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Now we've reached a portion of our worship service of which we can offer prayers to our Father in heaven. First, a responsive prayer together, and then we'll continue with prayer. Blessed Jesus, you ascended to the right hand of your Father's majesty, power, and glory, and now reign as eternal King of kings and Lord of lords. O ascended prophet, equipped your church to proclaim the precious gospel message of God's love for all the world. O ascended high priest, represent us before the Father as his own dear children and heirs. Defend us against Satan's every accusation. Ask for the Father's rich blessing in our everyday lives. O ascended king, direct the affairs of the governments and nations that they serve the best interest of your church. As the disciples lifted up their eyes to watch your ascension, so lift our eyes daily to you, 
for your coming again in glory. We pray, we pray, Lord, that you may grant all things in Christ so that we are sustained and strengthened through trial, that in our weaknesses we are delivered from trouble. Lord, we pray that your church would flourish, that the good news of Christ, who is crucified, risen, and ascended, would be proclaimed throughout the world to all people, that they may hear and that they may turn away from their sins, repent, and cling to you as the Savior. Father, we pray for the nations of the earth that they may seek peace, that the leaders of our country may pursue justice, righteousness, and peace. We pray that this pandemic may come to a soon end, and that the livelihood and common life of many may resume. Father in heaven, we also pray for all those that are sick, that are struggling against an illness. We ask that you be with them, that you would comfort them, and give them the strength to bear up under this illness. And we pray that it be your will that would come to an end, and you'd restore them to health. Lord, we pray that you'd lead us to be faithful, that we'd always rejoice in you, that we would not let the current situation that we are in determine your love for us or our love for you, but that we would trust, Lord, that you are outside the situation, ever taking care of your people and controlling all things for the good of your people. Father in heaven, hear us when we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Believe in hearts, the Lord receive the blessing of the true God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We'll conclude our worship this evening by singing hymn 213, Hail the day that sees him rise there on page 7.